So I want to welcome you to the next in our seminars by the recipients of the 2021 Nurse Early Career Achievement Awards. Um, and just for those of you who maybe don't know, we have um, these uh, achievement awards we give out every year and the presented and, and we should recognize extraordinary contributions from early career scientists who have used NERSC in their research. So we're, we're really happy to be able to support um, early career scientists using NERSC. We have two, one for a high impact scientific achievement and another category for innovative use of high performance computing. We're, we're really pleased today um, to be able to hear from Abby, um, Abigail, Abby, I think people call it. Call you from um, Caltech. We're talking about um, her work with Supernova. And Abby, just uh, in recognition, here's a virtual certificate that if we can get a, 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 real, a real mail address from you, we'll send you a real, real hard copy of it. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Abby. All right. Well, I'll start sharing. Um... Oh, I always forget what's the best way to do this, but um, can you see my talk now? Yes, great. Okay, great. Uh, I'm realizing I already forgot to change the title, but um, thank you, first of all, for the award and for having me speak today. Um, I'm Abigail or Abby Polin. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at Carnegie Observati Observatories in Caltech, a joint position. Uh, but most of this work was done when I was a grad student at Berkeley and uh, an affiliate at LBL. So I did want to take a second and also thank my advisors, Peter Nugent and Dan Kaysen for advising me through all of this work. And I think also for nominating me for this award, pretty sure. Um, but uh, I forget the title I gave you guys on the email, but um, this one is how to, how to blow up Ch some Chandra Sagar mass white doors and how to find them. Uh, I do realize that not everybody in the audience today is going to be an astronomer though. So I thought I would start with a little bit of background on the general problem before getting into the nitty gritty of what I do with NERSC. Can I advance slides? Yes, I can. Great. So for a supernova physicist, a really good night is when a galaxy goes from looking like this to looking like this. That one little speck of light is what we go after each and every night. Um, and there are two main ways that we can get information out of that light. The first one, the most basic and the easiest data to take is a light curve. So basically looking at that speck in the sky and measuring how bright it appears over time as it gets brighter, peaks, and then dies off and disappears from our view. Uh, and again, this is just luminosity versus time. It is a light curve. It can tell us basically what's powering the supernova. Is it powered by radioactive decay of elements created in the explosion core? Is it heated by shock waves colliding with uh, surrounding medium, et cetera? Um, we can also, where uh, this takes more telescope time, we can take a spectrum. So at any given point in time in that light curve, we can take a closer look and ask what the different, um, how much energy is coming from what wavelength of light. Uh, and when we take a spectrum uh, during the photospheric phase and the early phases as we're getting brighter and shortly after we start getting dim, we'll see something that looks like this, which would be more like a black body continuum, except for that there are chunks missing out of absorption features as photons are being absorbed by different elements. So in this manner, spectra can tell us about the composition of the supernova ejecta. Um, these missing chunks are attributed to a specific element uh, that we know is present in that ejecta absorbing photons. And if we come back night after night and take more and more spectrum, spectra, as the ejecta expands, um, as it expands, it becomes more diffuse. We can see through more of it and we can see further and further into the core of the supernova. So if this will play over time, as we trace the photosphere retreating into the center of the ejecta, we can measure the composition of various radii in this ejecta over time. And eventually you'll see these 
absorption chunks, these absorption troughs change into, oh, I guess the thing stops before then. But uh, eventually, if we followed it long enough, instead of absorption features, we'd start seeing emission features. So peaks as the um, ejecta starts to cool down. So I study mostly, or at least the work that was cited for this award was mostly a specific type of supernova called a type 1a supernova. And they're characterized in these ways that I just showed you with a light curve that is powered by the radioactive decay of nickel 56. And that determines the peak of this light curve. Eventually that radioactive nickel 56 decays into cobalt 56, which is still radioactive. It just has a longer half-life and releases photons more slowly. And so we get this initial nickel powered peak followed by a cobalt powered tail. The spectra, at, if we take them right here around this peak, uh, show absorption features from intermediate mass elements like calcium and silicon and sulfur, telling us that surrounding this radioactive core in the supernova ejecta, we have these sorts of what we call intermediate mass elements in a shell around that core absorbing photons as they try to escape. Um, the really cool thing about type 1a supernovae is traditionally these light curves all look very similar to one another. So they have a similar width and a similar peak and a similar shape telling us that they're powered by a similar amount of nickel 56. And this is really powerful for science because if we know how bright they are, we can use them to tell us how far away something is, right? So if we just break it down really, really simply, if I have a 60 watt light bulb, I know how bright that is and that it's supposed to be brighter than a 30 watt light bulb if they're sitting side by side. But if I move that 60 watt light bulb further away, it will appear dimmer to me. But if I know that that is a 60 watt light bulb, it's just far away, I can use the difference between its intrinsic luminosity, its absolute magnitude, with its apparent brightness to tell me how far away that I have moved it. And this is a really powerful tool in astrophysics using this type 1a supernovae as our light bulbs. If we can get, if we know what type of light bulb they are, right? We need to know, is it a 60 watt light bulb or a 30 watt light bulb? Um, and for that, we depend on really, really good data of supernovae that we can measure their distance some other way. So this is 2011 FE. It is, I think, still our most well-observed type 1a supernova, and it was very close, and we have a lot of other measures about how far away the galaxy that this supernova occurred in. So we can use things like this, and we can use Cepheids as our kind of calibrations to say, okay, well, these are 60 watt light bulbs. So when we see them far away, we know how far away they are. And you've probably heard, being that this is LBL, of uh, the 2011 Nobel Prize awarded to Saul Perlmutter, Adam Rees, and Brian Schmidt. Um, using the power of these type 1a supernovae, they realized that when they measured the distance to the furthest away supernovae, that they were receding faster uh, than what was expected due to just Hubble expansion alone. So therefore, the universe had to um, the expansion of the universe ha must have accelerated uh, between the time that these really distant supernovae went off and the time that their light reached us today. Um, however, this was really phenomenal. It's Nobel Prize worthy, but we're still arguing about the exact um, number uh, to attribute to the relative rate of that expansion, the Hubble constant. And it turns out over time, the measurements in here on blue from these supernovae are getting pretty, uh, our error bars are decreasing, but they're decreasing and uh, creating a dichotomy between the, the measurement we make with supernovae as our distance measures and the measurements we make uh, using the CMB. And then this green point here is the new method we'll have in the near future of standard sirens as we get uh, more gravitational wave objects that also have um, observed electromagnetic counterparts. Uh, right now we only have one of those. Um, but so why, why is this happening? It can be a couple things. It can be that uh, the Hubble constant actually was a different value uh, at the stage of the universe that the CMB is measuring and the supernovae are measuring. Or it can be that we don't understand some of the errors between these two numbers. 
And this is not my field. This is not my concentration. This is more of why my field is important. <laughs> um, but to start with, I would like to point out that I just lied to you. Turns out type 1a supernovae are not actually all exactly the same. So they're close. When we measure their peak luminosity, uh, MV here, and plot that against the amount of um, the amount they had dim over the next 15 days, delta M15. So that's kind of a measure of the width of this light curve as well as the peak. Um, they occupy a very, they originally anyways, occupied a very tight region known as the Phillips relation here, where there is there is a variation in the magnitude and hence the, the amount of nickel power in these and in the width. Um, but over time, as technology has advanced, as we've developed better, better telescopes and we've moved from a couple supernovae uh, per you know month to uh, several per day. Um, turns out the diversity of type 1a supernovae is pretty large. We have these normal uh, standardizable candles on the Phillips relation here, but we also have uh, overbright type 1a supernovae that still look pretty normal, these 91 Ts, and then really overbright super Cs that don't look that normal. We have subluminous ones. We have guys that um, the delta M15 is too small. And then there's a whole bunch of other sort of also thermonuclear transients that may or may not be related to the type 1As we know. But the question becomes, how do we actually standardize all of these? And if not all of them are standardizable, how do we know which ones to use in our Hubble measurements? And that's where theorists like me come in and say, OK, <laughs> Well, I think we're at the stage where we really, really need to understand what is blowing up here and how. Are these all the same thing? Are we seeing more than one phenomena here? Uh, and that's more what I focus on. So I'm a theorist. Uh, I'm a computational astrophysicist, if you might have guessed by me winning a NERSC award. Uh, I, I do use supercomputers. Uh, and I model supernovae. And this process generally involves three kind of major steps. There is stellar evolution. We need to know what we're exploding. What does it look like at the time of explosion? What kind of companion does it have? How does this affect um, the age and distribution and density of the star that explodes? Then we need to actually explode the thing. We need to perform hydrodynamic simulations with full nucleosynthesis involved in that hydrodynamic steps concurrently because the energy released by nuclear reactions actually can change the hydrodynamics. Uh, and this determines the ejecta composition of the star. And we could stop there. We learn things from that. But if we wanna be able to apply this to the real problems in astronomy right now, we need to take it a step further. We don't need to just ask, what does this explosion look like from a hydrodynamic sense? We need to say, what would that supernova ejecta look like if I viewed it through a telescope, if it were a real explosion, uh, you know, at a red shift of whatever that I'm viewing through my telescope, what would the light curves and spectra look like? And that's uh, called radiative transport calculations um, to determine all the physics that goes on with the photons as they're released from that ejecta and travel to us. I do two out of three of these things. I do the hydrodynamic simulations with nucleosynthesis and the radiative transport. And that's what I will talk to you about today. Oh, yes, I threw in the, the lovely picture of Corey because all of my thesis work was, was um, performed here at NERSC. So anyways, going back to type 1a supernovae, let's, since I'm skipping the stellar evolution part because I know pretty much what I'm exploding from the light curve and the spectra of observations. Uh, I know, again, my ejecta ball needs to look like a center core of radioactive nickel 56 surrounded by a shell of intermediate mass elements. Um, that tells me what is happening here is I am exploding a carbon oxygen white dwarf. That's what gives us this kind of distribution um, as that carbon oxygen burns up the alpha chain uh, into heavier and heavier elements. So at the densest regions of the core, we get these radioactive elements. As the burning mechanism moves out through the star, uh, we reach less and less dense regions and we burn less and less completely until we even can have a layer outside here um, of unburnt material of carbon oxygen. Um, however, 
there is more than one ways to blow up a white dwarf. <laughs> um, so the original idea here was pretty ingenious of if all type 1a supernovae look the same, then they all should kind of be blowing up the same, right? And we can take advantage of the fact that we know carbon oxygen white dwarfs are supported by electron degeneracy pressure. Um, and that electron de degeneracy pressure has an intrinsic mass limit, the Chandrasekhar mass, where above this mass limit, it can no longer support itself through electron degeneracy pressure. So if anything happens to this white dwarf that pushes it above that limit, something needs to happen. Uh, something needs to heat up, something can then explode. It just, it can't be a white dwarf anymore. Um, and so our original thought was just take a carbon oxygen white dwarf at the Chandrasekhar mass limit and let's detonate it at the center. Turns out when you do that, you get too much nickel. You get too bright of an event. Okay, so maybe instead of a detonation, we should deflagrate the whole star. We should burn it subsonically. And then we get the opposite problem. We don't get enough nickel. We get too dim of an event uh, to, to explain kind of either side of that Phillips relation. So why don't we do both, right? Why don't we deflagrate for a little bit to puff things up and make them less dense and hot enough that by the time we then transition to a detonation, we can burn some nickel 56, but we can still leave behind some of these intermediate mass elements. And that's pretty successful. We can vary the amount of nickel we create doing that a little bit, but we don't actually understand how that happens physically. We just say deflagrate for this long and then detonate because we've only gotten to the point in the real world in the labs where we're starting to be able to replicate this process and understand how it works. So given that we're turning knobs, you know, we would hope that we could create then the entire diversity of type 1a supernovae, but we still can't. And so that brings us to, oh, sorry, that was supposed to be skipped, to my radical topic of, okay, so if we can't explain the entire diversity of type 1a supernovae by varying how much deflagration we do before detonating, um, what else do we have? Well, we can change the mass of the white dwarf exploding, maybe. Um, but how do we do that? If the whole concept was they explode because they exceed the Chandrasekhar mass limit, we need another way of initiating an explosion if we're blowing up something less massive. And so that concept came up around the 80s with uh, Ken Nomoto and Stan Woosley, uh, came up with this me mechanism called the double detonation mechanism, where you have a carbon oxygen white dwarf that has gained a surface shell of helium. And it turns out it's way easier to ignite helium than it is to ignite carbon or oxygen. So you ignite that helium shell. And when the burning occurs around the shell, it sends a shock front into the center of the white dwarf. When that shock front converges, it compresses the carbon oxygen, heats it up and creates a detonation. And again, we understand detonations. So then we can model the thermonuclear runaway after that detonation and get a type 1A-like explosion. And in this mechanism, we can vary the amount of the mass of the carbon oxygen white dwarf and the mass of the helium shell. And hopefully in some region of this parameter space, get explosions that look like type 1A supernovae. Now, originally in the 1980s, um, the computational power at the time only had resolution capabilities to be able to do this with a significant amount of helium on the surface of the white dwarf. And as I'll show you later, those don't look like type 1a supernovae. There's too much helium on the surface that we don't expect in those explosions. So they're kind of tossed out for a long time until around 2010, um, Lars Bilston and Ken Shen, amongst others with updated nuclear networks and updated resolution capabilities show that, aha, we can actually use this mechanism to explode um, white doors with very thin helium shells. And so thick helium shells in nature would come from a non-degenerate companion, like a helium SDB star, but thin helium shells would come from a degenerate companion, like a white dwarf, white dwarf binary. So I stepped in at the beginning of my thesis with much prompting from Peter of, okay, so let's ignore for now, what the companion is going to be. Let's just create a large parameter space of white dwarf masses 
and helium shell masses and say which ones are viable 1A candidates. And for the others, what, what do they look like? Do those happen? Do they exist in nature? So here's a movie of what I was just talking about getting into my work. Um, we have on the left here temperature and on the right density of a white dwarf with a helium shell sitting on the surface. We're about to ignite the helium on the surface. Burning around that helium shell, you see a shock front traveling to the center of the white dwarf. And I apologize because I'm not good at the zoom jumps here. But the shock wave will converge, we'll get thermonuclear runaway, and hopefully a 1A-like explosion. But again, in order for it to be 1A, we want that center radioactive material, then intermediate mass elements, and then unburnt material. So let's take a look at the same simulation, uh, but broken down into what is created. So again, here we have that same density movie. Here will be a sum of um, the mass fraction of the sum of all radioactive elements, and here's all the intermediate mass elements. So you can see immediately that we might have a problem. That with this case, which is the case of a very large helium shell, <coughs> we create all of this radioactive material on the outside of the ejecta. And this is what I was talking about with Stan Woosley's models in the 1980s. This doesn't look like a type 1A supernova. We want uh, this ejecta to go from heaviest to intermediate to light. But I only showed you the thick helium shell case because you can actually see the burning in the movie. <laughs> in the, the lower and lower mass of helium shell that I give you, the less and less of this radioactive material that I make on the outside of the ejecta. So it's my job then to complete this parameter space and ask how these shell yields affect the observations. But this is a hard problem to do. <laughs> um, this is a hard problem to do computationally. Um, this was a 2D simulation. Sorry, I'm seeing the, the, um, the questions in the thing now. Feel free to interrupt me. These are, these are what I'm working on now. The published work is all 1D, but I'm showing the, the preview of the 2D stuff. Um, so this is a really hard simulation to perform because um, we need to resolve a huge number of orders of magnitudes of scales. Nuclear burning fronts, in order to actually resolve them, which we typically don't, we typically play other games, would require a resolution of about one kilometer. But we also need to expand it to the point that all of the burning is done, all of the hydrodynamics is done, we're in a steady state. And that's about 10 to the fifth kilometers for homologous expansion. So you know, translating this to computational resolution, 1D, 10 to the five, okay, we can do that. 2D, 10 to the 10, I don't know. And 3D is kind of right out with 10 to the 15 resolution if we just do it in a standard Eulerian static grid fashion. Um, and we, we can't, we can't do that that way. So what I do is I use Castro a massively parallel compressible hydrodynamics code <coughs> developed by a group here at, uh, well, there at LBL uh, with Ann Algren and Don Wilcox and all of those guys, as well as in Santa Barbara, not Santa Barbara, Stony Brook uh, with Mike Singali. They're all amazing <laughs> and have been so helpful to me through my PhD. Um, but I use Castro because it's capable of adaptive mesh refinement. Also, it has the radioactive uh, net, not the radioactive, the nuclear networks involved in it. So I forgot to mention a slide ago that just the hydro resolution is 10 to the five, but you do need to double the time steps in order to do nuclear burning because you need two burning time steps for every one hydro time step. So back to AMR, uh, and I'll go ahead and show the pretty 2D picture of AMR. AMR allows me to create regions of selective high resolution refinement. So where I'm performing nuclear burning or where I need to really, really pay attention to my shock fronts, I can look at regions that are a higher resolution than these areas that I still need, but can be static for now. Um, and this is a 2D example of this um, courtesy of Ken Chen. Um, but you can see we can have very large regions for the uh, circumstellar material, but like really, really 
high resolutions in order to uh, um, look at this is a case, I think this is a set off, not as, anyways, uh, you got your Raleigh Taylor fingers in there in order to uh, resolve shock fronts and turbulence and everything like that. But I can't stop there. Like I said, it's not enough at this point to just perform um, explosion models. We need to ask, do these explosion models translate to real life? And in order to do that, I need to do more <laughs> computer simulations uh, of these radiative transfer uh, calculations. And for that, I use Sedona, a Monte Carlo radiative transport code uh, written by Dan Kaysen, uh, one of my advisors. And now there's about a dozen of us developers still working on Sedona and bringing it into the modern era and adjusting it for increasingly cool problems. Um, so I'm gonna pause now and say very, very clearly, I just showed you awesome 2D movies as the question just asked. But now I'm gonna show you Sedona results from our 1D published model set of hydro models. So all of the, the results now are gonna be 1D. I'm working on multi-D now and we'll get back to that at the end, hopefully. Um, but I just always need to pause and make that very clear because a 1D movie communicates nothing, but these are 1D results. <laughs> So my 1D results, um, as I've alluded to this whole time, whether or not a double detonation is going to look like a type 1A supernova is really dependent on the mass of the helium shell. So I've broken these light curves, these synthetic light curves from our models into two categories. On the left here, I have uh, a number of light curves of varying masses of white dwarf, and these all have a very thin helium shells, one hundredth of a solar mass of helium on their surface. On the right here, I have the same masses of white dwarfs, but with a lot of helium on their surface, with uh, eight hundredths of a solar mass of helium on their surface. And if you remember from the beginning of what a 1A light curve is supposed to look like, it's this guy. We have a smooth rise, a nickel powered peak, uh, followed by a cobalt powered tail. Now, these guys have an extra bit that we don't see in type 1A supernovae. Uh, this initial um, early flux excess, this initial peak that comes before the uh, standard nickel peak. And this is due to that radioactive material burnt in the heavy helium shells that I showed you in the 2D movie. Um, turns out that radioactive material is mostly not nickel, it's mostly iron and chromium which have shorter half-lives than nickel, so it decays very quickly. It also sits at the outside of the ejecta, so it escapes, the diffusion time is very small, it escapes very quickly. And that's why we get a very, very early flux excess. Um, but light curve wise, if you'd hide that early part, which I can't do with my hand right now, <laughs> you'd get, you know, it follows by a more standard light curve, a nickel powered peak then, and then falling into a tail. But this early double peak feature is not something we see in type 1A supernovae. That story holds true when we look at the spectra. Again, these are synthetic spectra split into thin helium shells on the left here and thick helium shells on the right, where the different colors are different masses of underlying white dwarfs um, from heaviest at the top to lightest at the bottom. <coughs> Again, the thin helium shell spectra look like type 1a supernovae. We see these absorption features from these intermediate mass elements I pointed out to you earlier, like silicon and calcium. Um, and as we get to the lower mass ones, a little bit of titanium. But the thick helium shells, again, don't look like type 1a supernovae. Um, the helium shell ashes are so optically thick that they actually block photons from escaping in this blue region. And that's this flat line, this line blanketing we see. Um, and these are spectra taken at peak brightness. So this, this line blanketing continues through a lot of the supernova evolution of just photons, these blue photons not being able to escape uh, through the helium shell ashes. And so they look like almost similar to a supernova, uh, type 1A supernova, but just blocking a huge chunk of the um, spectrum. So, I'm going to focus now on the type 1A supernovae, because, or at least the type 1A supernovae candidates, 
because as I said earlier, those are the ones we care about for cosmology. Those are the ones we see in the real world. Uh, those are the ones we're hoping to explain at least some of with these subchandra models. So when we plotted our spectra sequence like this, again, heaviest or most, ah, most luminous uh, event at the top, because again, the heavier the mass of the white dwarf, the more nickel 56 it creates, the more luminous the event. Uh, we plotted that in order, <coughs> and we see a lot of the trends we hope to see in type 1a supernovae, like these intermediate mass features growing um, less pronounced for the brighter ones. But kind of more interestingly, we noticed this trend that as we get we increase the mass of the white dwarf, we also notice a blue shift in this uh, in in a lot of the lines. Um, you can see it most clearly in this silicon two line that we're increasing the velocity of this line as we get into brighter and brighter events. So the regions that are carrying the silicon are going faster in these events. And so this was our first thing that we said, aha. Well, let's see if we can compare this to real type 1a supernovae. Do they also show this kind of relationship where the brighter ones um, show faster silicon velocity? So in order to do this, we chose this um, population of type 1a supernovae uh, from this paper, Zhang et al. 2018. And these were all chosen from popular surveys, um, but chosen because they had fully resolved rise times of the light curve. So these are the ones we caught early on enough to have a full light curve. <coughs> um, but other than that, no cutoffs for whether or not they're a little weird or a little dim or a little bright. So we plotted these uh, using um, MB here is the absolute, the intrinsic brightness. <laughs> so the absolute brightness of the peak of the light curve, uh, not the apparent magnitude, but the absolute brightness of the, the peak of the light curve, so the brightest they get, the most luminous. Uh, and we plotted that against the velocity of the trough, the, the minimum of the trough of that silicon line. And then we put our models on top of here. And we saw something cool, <laughs> hopefully. Um, we saw that there were kind of two populations of observed supernovae. There is this population in this kind of banana shape that follows our modeled relationship of velocity versus magnitude. And then there's a cluster that sits over here, uh, a little brighter and a little slower than, than most of our models. And so we looked at this and said, OK, well, maybe this could be it. This could be our two populations of supernovae, those that originate from a subchandra progenitor uh, via a double detonation mechanism. And maybe these are something else. And if you do the back of the envelope calculations of, um, you know, calculating binding energy and figuring out the expected uh, mass from binding energy and velocity here, the, the mass of these would sit right around the Chandra Sekhar mass. So maybe these are the Chandra Sekhar mass explosions and these are the subchandras. And that would be really, really cool. And it looks like maybe, but you know, that's only to the machine learning tools of our eyeballs. There's not enough data here to really tell a compelling story just on this. So we started looking at other axes. And so far, <coughs> we have seen a number of ways that these two populations of type 1a supernovae separate themselves. So when we look at their color, um, so their B band, their maximum B band magnitude and their max minus their maximum V band magnitude, the ones that sit in this cluster are significantly bluer than the guys that lie along this relationship and they're bluer than any of our models. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Uh, I had a student this summer working on looking at carbon absorption features in these supernovae because um, due to the detonation nature of these subchandra explosions, they're very efficient at burning carbon and leave very little behind. So you would not expect to see a carbon absorption feature from a subchandra explosion. But you would from, you can anyways, from chandra Sekhar mass explosions, not all of them, but some of them. So uh, my summer student, um, Hayden, um, working with a Carnegie summer program, uh, went through all of this data and showed that um, the ones in red here are the carbon absorption feature ones, and they all kind of sit in this cluster. So that's pretty copacetic. <coughs> 
Then the last one is looking at nebular emission features. We also noticed that the ones that lie in this um, distribution show stronger calcium two emission, just like our models than the ones that sit in this cluster. So we have now three different axes by which these supernovae distinguish themselves, which is a start to saying, well, maybe we're looking at two different classes of supernovae, which is really important for cosmology because if these guys are different, we're not going to want to standardize them the same way that we standardize the ones that sit in this cluster or the normal ones. And what's even cooler about this plot B here, the color, it turns out that a lot of the time, these fast red events up here uh, have been historically problematic for our Hubble constant measurements um, because they're too red. Uh, in order to include them in our Hubble residuals, uh, we need to invoke maybe they're too red because there's extra dust in their environment and they're extra reddened. But what I am saying is perhaps they are more intrinsically red than these events. And so in order to include them in our Hubble measurements, we need to come up with a new kind of color correction, magnitude correction to standardize these guys than these guys. And maybe someday we'll be able to do that. Now, there's a really, really important question you all should be asking me at this point. And that is, if I want you to believe me that there is a significant portion of type 1a supernovae, and most rates at this point um, say maybe up to 30% that occur from this double detonation progenitor system, why don't we see these guys? If this mechanism can explode a white dwarf, what about the ones with thick helium shells? And this is a problem, or at least it was a problem for a while, um, because we know these, these systems exist. We have observed binaries with a white dwarf and a helium SDB star with separations that would turn into the stable mass accretion we need to build up a helium shell and explode them like this. Um, and at the time that I started this, at the time that I published this first paper on these 1D models, we hadn't seen anything that looked like this. Um, again, the signatures are this, this flux excess early on in the thermonuclear events light curve and the line blanketing for the spectrum. And we hadn't seen anything like this, but I was giving a similar talk to this in, I think it was summer 2018. Um, and I stopped here and a graduate student from Caltech, Kishile Day, who's now starting a postdoc at MIT. Uh, he just got a Hubble fellowship, I believe actually, um, <clears throat> came up to me and he said, I have an event you have to see. And he showed me this, and there's a little bit of spoilers in the title of the paper there. Uh, but this is supernova 18 BYG, or, or sorry, 19, your faces are covering the, no, it's 18. Your faces are covering my titles of my slides. <laughs> but um, so this was a thermonuclear odd type one supernova. We didn't want to call it, I mean, technically it's a 1A because it doesn't have hydrogen or helium, but it's not a normal 1A. So it's a peculiar type one. It exploded significantly offset from its host. And Kishile showed it to me because of two things, because this light curve here, this R-band light curve, um, it's too broad for a type 1a, or as I would like to say, it has an early flux excess in the early times. And if you look at the spectra, it is significantly line blanketed in the blue uh, for much of its evolution. So I got really excited. I said, okay, what I need you to do is I need you to send me your light curve data because I don't want to over bias myself. And for a well-resolved light curve like this, at least for my 1D models, I can only make you one model that will fit that light curve because the magnitude of this early flux excess is entirely dependent on the mass of a helium shell and how much radioactive material is made from that helium shell. <clears throat> 
but the peak of the light curve is entirely dependent on the central density or the total mass of the system. So white dwarf plus helium shell. So given that I have both of these data points, I can only make one model that will fit this event. So I did, I made this guy, which I, for some reason, have left the masses off of, but it's actually the, the 2D movie I showed you is the same mass of this. It is a 0.76 solar mass white dwarf with a 0.15 solar mass helium shell, which is a huge amount of helium. It is more helium than I included in my original 1D paper in any of those models because we thought that it was right out. If something like this happened, we would have seen it by now. Because they're normal brightness, we shouldn't miss them. But that's the model that fit it. I sent him back this light curve fit and the associated spectra, and he sent me back this. This was the fit for the spectra at the time of peak. And it is, I think to date, still the best <laughs> model fit I have ever made uh, for an event. Um, we show the line blanketing in the right region. We show the right velocities for these absorption features and the right uh, width for this, this calcium, calcium trough. This is the spectra at peak, but the rest of the spectra evolution was also great um, up through the point that I can actually trust my radiative transport LTE models. So we were, we were thrilled. Um, we published the paper and to date, uh, I'm pretty confident in saying this is the most direct evidence that we have that there is more than one way to explode a white dwarf, that this double detonation mechanism can explode a white dwarf because there is yet to be any other pending theory that, could, that can make this model. There could be someday, but there's not right now. So since then, we've had two other exciting events that we also think are thick shells, and there are more coming out, uh, both through archival data, we found a couple, and um, Hopefully we'll, more will happen in nature over time. So keep paying attention for the rate of these guys, I think will be constantly evolving. But what about what's next? Um, this is the last I have for you, these slides of, of what about the multi-D? Why haven't I published the multi-D? It's been a couple of years. Why isn't this happening? Uh, and it turns out it's almost prohibitively expensive. So this simulation I'm showing you here I am not even convinced that it is resolved completely yet. I would need to double the resolution one more time, but this costs something like 200,000 CPU hours on Cori, which is, I mean, it's possible to do a simulation like that. It is not possible to do a parameter of simulations like that. So I am waiting for the hope of the future. And that is that the Castro group knowing that the next era of computing is coming, have put in a huge amount of work to make Castro GPU capable, and Castro scales an order of magnitude faster on the GPUs. So hopefully you all have heard of uh, this machine, ProMutter, coming up in the near future. Uh, I think that is the hope of these kinds of simulations in the future, and I'm hoping that the other modeling groups are also working towards making their simulations GPU capable. And that's how, that's the only way we'll be able to do something like this in 3D in anything more than one simulation. That's all I have for you. So if you guys have any questions for me, uh, that would be great, but thank you again. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. So we've got a little bit of time for any questions anybody might have. So well, I guess I'll start with one, and maybe you said this, but I missed it, Abby. Was, um, so these, uh, these white dwarfs that explode by this mechanism are, are dimmer um, than the other ones? Is that, is that right? Mostly, yes. Um, so they can get almost as bright as a typical, as like the, what we classify as the normal 1A. Um, that might change a little bit in multi-D, you never know. Um, and there's a debate of exactly what the peak brightness is on them, but I would say I would more favor the subluminous end of the 1As for these guys. And, and you also mentioned um, you know, observations. You think you see systems that could do this and just wonder what are the, what are the statistics 
um, of the ones that should or could do it and the ones that you think you might actually be seeing? Yeah, um, that is a lovely question. Uh, right now, we're still not getting enough big shell events to explain the number of binaries we see. Um, and um, specifically, we have a slightly bigger problem of um, the ones we have caught have all been fairly offset from their galactic host. Uh, and we need to, um, we don't actually expect them all to be in older environments. Um, or, yes. So we need to start seeing them in other environments as well in order for this to actually work out. Or we need to start seeing the binaries in older environments, you know, one or the other. But, but again, I think we also had a problem historically that we didn't know what these were. So if you saw one, you probably ignored it. And you're still working on this problem. Um, and if, if so, when are you going to be able to start using ProMutter? Well, I mean, that would be more of a question for you all, right? <laughs> um, I, I submitted, I submitted a, you know, a request for time uh, on Perlmutter when that is a thing that can happen. And I've also requested to start being able to use my current allocation on Perlmutter, um, but I'm still- Oh, sure, yes. Um, yeah, if you're, <laughs> if you're not on there already, we'll get you on right away. Okay. Um, but I think I'm ready to go if, if that's the answer. I've done the convergence testing. I've done the, the model setup and that kind of thing on Corey. So it was just okay. a matter of when the time happens. Okay, great. Okay, other questions? No, well, if not, uh, well, thank you uh, again. I really enjoyed the talk and um, Thanks for joining us and sorry about the mix up at the beginning. That's okay. Thank you again for having me. Okay, thanks everybody, bye.